Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews Live UCP Leadership Debate Series, where we are going to be talking about the UCP debate with two great guests. One you know already, he's been on the show, uh, I think, twice already, Mr. Spencer Bennett. Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. And a relatively newcomer to the show. We relatively just met uh, a few weeks ago, but I'm happy to have her on, is Nadine Wellwood. Nadine, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. So, uh, before we get started, I'm hearing an echo in myself, so I'm going to try and figure out where that's coming from. So I do apologize. Because I have three live streamings going on, and I do apologize. Oh, I don't know what's going on. I do apologize for this. I apologize everyone who is listening to this right now. I swear to God, I'm usually better prepared than this. And people are just going, why is this guy not prepared? Because this is what happens. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. And that's what happens when you do things wrong and you show up like the UCP leadership debate when there's interruptions because the live stream just doesn't work properly. And I was going to try and do this so smoothly, but it does not happen when you're doing it and you're trying to make fun of somebody and it doesn't work. But here we are. Nadine Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, pardon me? I said, at least you didn't lose us completely. There you go. I didn't lose you. I just sounded like a complete fool talking to myself for five minutes. But we just saw seven candidates, and I'm going to uh, name them off here because I want to make sure I name them off correctly. Todd Lowen, Daniel Smith, Rajan Sani, Rebecca Schultz, Leela here, Travis Taves, and... Uh, Brian Jean, we're on the stage for the first official UCP leadership debate. This is the first sanction by the party, which all of them had to attend. There was one already beforehand, and there's a Western Standard uh, debate coming up at the front runners in a few days, actually in a few weeks, if I'm not mistaken. But this was when we saw all the candidates on for the first time. Before we get into the analysis of the night, I want to start off with the million dollar question. We already know the answer for uh, Spencer, and that is, are you UCP member? Uh, Nadine, we do not know that about you, so that way people can actually understand where you're coming from when you're giving analysis of this, or are you just a political observer like myself? You know, this uh, election in particular, and it does start with the leadership review and appointing the right leader to take us into 2023 to go up against Notley, is far too important for people to be on the sidelines. So yes, I am a UCP member and I strongly, strongly, if there is ever a time to be, uh, have your voice heard, make it heard now, because as one of the candidates did say tonight, you know, the election of this leader and 2023 is fast approaching. That is going to set the direction of this province for the next decade. I argue longer. So this is the time. If you don't belong to the UCP, um, you need to become a membership. You have till uh, I'm putting a plug in here, August 12th. You know, get your membership. Make sure you cast a ballot. Have your voice heard. Make it count. And before we continue on, I, I because we I, again, Spencer, I apologize for not letting you talk here, but we we kind of already had the introduction in your first episode that we did uh, back in earlier this month. But Nadine, ha do you have a horse in this race? Have you chosen your candidate? Have you backed a horse, or are you still undecided and still waiting to see where the chips fall as this uh, race un uh, progresses? No, I've definitely chosen my horse in this one, and uh, I, do you want me to say now? Or yeah, you, you, you can say later? now, because uh, I'm pretty sure I can openly say, uh, uh, Spencer, you, you're okay with me saying who you've backed, right? Because yeah. you've done it, which is Travis Taves, but uh, Nadine, who have you backed in this race? I'm a definitely uh, going with Danielle Smith. It's the Sovereignty Act for me, and uh, we need a way to push back against Ottawa. Angry letters is just not going to cut it, and Taves and so many of the other candidates that have already been a part of the administration, they had their chance. The reason we're having this leadership review is because they didn't do their job, and the people have lost confidence, and it's time for new leadership. So Danielle Smith for me all the way. 
Well, I'm looking forward to the next hour of debate then, because I can imagine it's going to be a colorful one, because I always like when I bring people of opposite sides together in a very nice, happy-go-lucky way. But I'm going to start with you, Spencer, because I did let Nadine speak for a few seconds there. Um, the debate. Let's talk about the style before we get into the substance. Um, we saw an echo of the federal leaders debate with the progressive conservatives where you couldn't address each other unless you had the minute and 45 seconds after t answering the question and you have to choose your opponent. And then you had 45 seconds if you held up a paddle. But thank God there was no horns when you addressed Prime Minister Trudeau. It was a little bit better, but how did you like the style of the debate compared to other debates that you've seen? You know, I, I didn't mind it. Um, it's hard when you have eight candidates on stage at the same time. Um, when Sometimes when you have three or four, I'm thinking federal election debates, and you just have them talking over each other all the time, and nobody has heard, and they're just looking for sound bites, and it's not very productive. Um, so I thought this was more productive than debates where people are just talking over each other and are being jerks and you can't really hear what's going on. Um, so it wasn't bad considering how many candidates were involved. I thought, you know, it could have been better, could have been worse, but it wasn't terrible except for the live stream cut out. Well, and I think that's, I, Nadine and I talked about that before you jumped on our Zoom call here was... In 2022, you think they'd be able to get this right, but I, I'm not sure in the airport hangar that they were doing it in if they had proper internet connection, but that's here nor there. But Nadine, what about yourself? For the style of the debate, did you think it was beneficial to Albertans who were watching it? Let's take out the consideration of the live stream interruptions, the bad feed, but the, in, the actual back and forth that we saw, the, the actual uh, conversations that we saw. Did you think it was beneficial to Albertans? Absolutely. I think Spencer hit the nail on the head. You know, you can always do things a little bit better, but it's a lot of candidates. And I thought, you know, having been on the stage um, and not actually having a chance to really debate, because in a lot of the federal um, elections that have been held as of recently, they don't really, uh, locally, they don't do debates. They really host this, here, let me ask you a question, and you don't get a chance to review anybody at all. And so I thought they dealt with that really well. I thought they kept the time fair amongst everybody if you got, you know, called out, which a lot of them did. Um, you know, you had a chance to kind of, you know, have a, a say and, and, and respond to that. The only thing I thought was, for me, a little odd was the moderator himself. I, I you know, turning around to the audience all the time, you know, I, eh, I was like, yeah. I know you got to keep it under control. You want to give as much time to the candidates. You don't want the applause. Um, but it just reminded me way too much of that federal debate with, you know, Ro Rosie, was it, you know, from the CBC? It's just, come on. <laughs> Well, and for transparency's sake, that is Jeff Davison. He ran for mayor of Calgary in the last uh, municipal election. I, I, I will be honest, I was actually a little taken back that he was there. I thought they would have gotten someone from Medicine Hat to actually do the debate in Medicine Hat because I don't know if Jeff Davison is a known name outside of the city of Calgary. He might be, but for me, I, I was a little taken back. And his folksy attitude, which is what he's known for, was a little bit jarring for me because he was trying to be everyone's friend. And as the moderator, you're not supposed to be the story. You're supposed to be the actual moderator and just move things along. Um, while the choice of the moderator can be debated till the end of the earth, he was there. He did do a good job of progressing it, I found. Would you not agree? Where he gave everyone ample time to answer the questions and actually uh, like rebut. Because in those four-minute segments where the two candidates squared off, they kept on going back and forth, right? Like, did you not agree? Did you not like that? Or was there things that they could have improved on the moderation of it? Spencer? Oh, no, I thought that was good. Um, I think Nadine made an interesting point in you about clapping um, or booing or cheering. I almost feel like that's a natural part of debate. And I think that you do allow it, you know, for, I don't know, 10 but, seconds, something like that. A reasonable amount of natural um, reactions, I think, is, is acceptable and okay, so long as it's not rude or catcalling or booing or jeering, those types of things. But if it's, you know, clapping and applause, 
I think that that's reasonable within a short time period. Nadine, yourself, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, for a lot of people watching, you need to understand the mood, the audience, you know, what the other people are thinking in response to the, the candidates themselves. And I think the natural emotional response of clapping, I'm not a big fan of booing because I think that's very disrespectful. It takes a lot of courage for all of these candidates to stand on that stage and to give their views and opinions. So I don't think any of them deserve to be booed. But, you know, some applause deservedly needed to be louder and was uh, <laughs> more than others. And I think that should have shown through a little bit more. So I think that, you know, they just tried to clamp down a little bit too tight on it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, because my my feed was cutting in and out. I might have missed a boo or two if I if there, there was there an actual boo during the debate. Uh, I don't recall hearing any and he kept a really tight control okay okay uh, because you kept on saying booze and i was like was there a boo and i missed it and i didn't get that feed because i was trying to switch between facebook and the website so okay good to hear but let's turn to the crux of the this this conversation and that is the candidates themselves um i'm gonna start from right, left to right on or right to left or left to right on the stage so we're gonna start with todd lowen Independent MLA from uh, Central Peace Notley up in uh, northern Alberta. Um, what what would you give his performance? What would you rate his performance? Was it a good night, bad night for him? Because I don't really remember what he said. And that's just from my perspective. And you guys are UCP members. So uh, we'll start with Nadine. Then we'll go to Spencer on this one. But Nadine, for Todd Lowen, what did you think of his performance tonight? And we'll get into actual like who won the debate later on. But right now we'll just talk about, was there any highlights for you for Todd Lowen? Yeah, I think Todd, uh, as far as Todd goes, I think he had a good night. I've watched uh, three of these debates now, and I think as far as Todd's performance goes, this was by far the better uh, performance that he's had in any of them. Um, it is, you know, he lacks a little bit of the, what should I say, curb appeal. Um, that some of the energy of like a Daniel Smith or a Taves or even tonight, I thought um, uh, Shawnee just she had the energy and the punch and was with it. So I thought she did really well. So but with Todd, Todd's knockout tonight was when he called out um, Taves in the end in his closing remarks. And because Toes, Taves, sorry, who, you know, has been a part of cabinet in a very, very high level position, had the ear of the premier and decided, you know, to show his loyalty to the party and to the premier and not to his constituents. Um, you know, Todd kind of called him out on that earlier. And Tabe's response back to that was, you know, well, I chose to stay in rather than be on the outside and then snipe about it. Well, you know, Todd Lowen in his closing remarks that was where he kind of came back and said, you know, uh, he called him out for for exactly that. And I thought that was his best comment for the entire night. If he did nothing else, that was priceless. What about yourself, uh, Spencer? Or Todd Lowen's uh, performance. What do you? What would you rate it? What would you give it? Were there any notable punches that he was able to deliver? I mean, to me, we Todd Lowen is a one-trick pony, um, and that pony is the past with COVID and COVID restrictions. I don't know what he has to offer as a vision for the future of Alberta. Um, like he didn't talk a lot about his idea to, to diversify the economy or make healthcare better, those types of things. He seems to be, you know, and, and hopefully COVID is in the rear view mirror. Um, and so I don't know what value Todd brings to the table. He's a nice guy. I know Todd, a good trapper up, up there, but um, I think it was an, an okay night for Todd's standards but not to be the next leader of, of our country, or of our province. No, I, I had a guest on the show earlier on today when I, I did an interview, and I asked this question, and I want to ask this to both of you, because you both seem like, uh, well, you're both UCP members, so you would know this a little bit more, but Todd was all about, we don't want to write letters anymore. We want to stop writing letters. We like le Writing letter campaigns is doing nothing for the relationship between Ottawa and Alberta. The question is, though, 
didn't Todd write a nasty letter about Jason Kenny saying he should resign? Like, is it not a double standard when he's saying we can't write nasty letters to Ottawa because it's not getting us anywhere? But then he'll turn around and write a nasty letter saying, Jason Kenny, you need to resign. And then two days later, he gets kicked out of caucus. Is, an, is he not playing double standards there? Anyone wants to take this, go ahead. Because I, I, I just find it fascinating. <laughs> go, go, Nadine. Well, I, I think the interesting thing there is not the act of writing an angry letter, it's the outcome and the result. So Todd Lowen's outcome of that angry letter um, is a lot different than the angry letters that they're talking about sending to Ottawa. Ottawa probably doesn't even open them. It's like, yeah, return to sender, ha <laughs> ha, off it goes. Whereas Todd was effective in writing that letter. He was effective in both his constituents and if you consider the fact that he played a role in the fact that we're having a leadership race, you know, and, and the comment that I made earlier about in his closing remarks um, and, and addressing Taves and how he did, you know, Taves came after him on the issue of unity. Like that was a big, big thing for Taves. It's about unify everybody, bring everybody together. Well, Taves was there when they kicked Todd Lowen out for speaking out. And I mean, how is that for hypocrisy, right? So the one thing I think Todd really does um, in this entire election uh, process and in, in leadership review, uh, you know, election is is he calls out the hypocrisy because he is it, right? Here's Taves calling on unity, and yet here's you know Todd Lowen who got kicked out for speaking up for his constituents, which Taves actually admitted he did from the outside, which got him kicked out, but he did it. And, and just you know, just so for clarification, because I, I just I apologize for interrupting Nadine. I want to make sure this is clear. That was a secret ballot. We don't know if Todd voted to expel him from caucus or not. And I'm not uh, saying that Todd or Tavis did, but I'm just saying that it's a secret ballot. I know the Western Standard had some leaks around it, but I don't know if he voted against it or for it. So I just want to put that on record as well, because I don't want the Tavis people, because I want him to show up on the show one day. So, so, so I just putting that on the record there. Um, uh, uh, Spencer, I'll send it over to you for one last thing, and then we'll move on to Danielle Smith, the next in line. Sure. So, I mean, the COVID restrictions were certainly very difficult, and I certainly didn't agree, didn't agree with all of the restrictions or certainly the timing of some of those restrictions too. Um, but Alberta had some of the least restrictive restrictions across Canada. We were one of the few places that, you know, we limited the size of churches for a while, but we kept them open. Um, places like BC totally shut them down for months and months at a time. And so I feel like, you know, it would have been nice if things had remained open longer, but I'm grateful that we had the government that we did. Um, in terms of being outside caucus or inside caucus, I feel like you can get more stuff done if you can find a way to diplomatically agree with, disagree with people and, and remain inside. Um, because somebody chirping from the outside, all he can literally do is write angry letters. He has he's lost all of his influence. He's lost all of his friends. Um, and he has no ability to, to make change because his circles of influence have, have shrunk significantly. Whereas if you have somebody that remains in caucus and is able to disagree, but able to do so in such a way to, you know, diplomatically, then I think you can actually make real lasting change. Perfect. And that's the end of Todd Lowen's little speech here because we have seven five, six other candidates that we need to get to in another 45 minutes so i want to try and get through them as quickly as possible but i want to go to danielle smith as nadine started the last time i'm going to throw it to spencer this time because i'm pretty sure i know where nadine's going to go because as she said at the beginning she is a supporter but spencer um how did danielle smith do in your opinion and we yet again don't talk about winners and losers but overall what did you think of her performance tonight um, I thought it was okay. Like she's the perceived front runner, so certainly she was attacked by the other candidates. And I think that that's the nature of any any debate that big. When you have the front runner, they're they're the attack, you know, for the other candidates, right? And I think that she handled herself okay. Um, but I feel like on some issues, like especially the preventative cancer issue, that if you're explaining, you're losing. Um, and so sometimes it's better just to apologize, say you know, and have a brief introduction, but I, I think she took that too long. Um, and I didn't really understand, like the concept of a health spending account kind of makes sense to me, but it was almost as if she was connecting the dots to say, if we have a health spending account, we can take preventative me measures and not get cancer. Um, so for example, you can go to your doctor or chiropractor or massage therapist, 
I don't know any massage therapist or chiropractor that can prevent me from getting cancer. Um, so while I'm not, preve I think that we should be taking more steps towards preventative measures. I think she could could have handled that question quite a bit better. Um, but I think that on the positive side, she did have some good ideas. She talked about hydrogen and you know all these different ways to diversify the energy sector and those types of things. So I think she was strong in some of those regards. But I think that she needs to be better at addressing some of those, um, for lack of a better term, bozo eruptions that all candidates are guilty of sometimes. Nadine, what about yourself? The highs and lows of Danielle Smith. Um, I probably don't disagree with Spencer, actually. Um, I think there are some areas of hers that are just so strong and she can speak to them so articulately and effortlessly. And then there's others like the healthcare spending account, which, you know, in my opinion, it's just in my opinion, um, I would not necessarily have focused so much effort um, in this leadership on that. That may be more of an issue when it comes to Notley, but for, I think, the conservatives in the UCP membership, they are looking for the bigger issues, the inflation, the economy, the jobs. Um, how are we going to deal with lowering, you know, the cost of living, affordability, those things. And I think when it comes to those things, she's got good ideas and good plans. And I love the idea of the Sovereignty Act. You know, we can't write angry letters anymore. But I think for her high, again, in her closing statement, she took the time to talk about, you know, the fact that the reason we are having this um, election is because conservatives stopped acting like conservatives and the Kenny administration really became liberal light. And, you know, the premier, the MLAs, all of them, they played a part in that. And, uh, you know, the central issue there is who's going to stand up to Ottawa. I think she was bang on. Who's going to stand up to Ottawa? That's how Kenny rallied everybody and unified the UCP to begin with. And I think he fell so flat uh, on that. And, and they've broken trust with their members. I think that's where she's really rallying uh, the troops. Now, I, I did see the paddle from the gentleman from... Uh up in uh, northern, uh, well, central is in Edmonton area. I keep on forgetting where you're from. I do apologize for that. Spruce Grove. Spruce Grove. I'm, I'm writing that down. Spruce Grove. From the member of Spruce Grove, I did see your paddle. You have 45 seconds for a rebuttal. And then we'll go to the <laughs> chicken round where we'll all have to cluck like a chicken for 10 minutes. But go ahead, Spencer. What are you going to say? Thank you. And please hold your applause. Um, so respectfully, I feel like the Sovereignty Act is is just a letter to Ottawa that is not practical nor reasonable, um, and nor can can actually work. Um, now, what the Kenny government has done: number one was Bill One, scrapping the carbon tax, which they did, and the Feds did it. But at least they got rid of the carbon tax. They had a vote on equalization. They had the Fair Deal panel, which included, um, a, you know, Alberta RCMP force and Alberta pension plan and a lot of other things that have never been talked about, nor has there been any steps towards. So, you know, while I wish we could have a better deal with Ottawa, I feel like the things that we have accomplished is more than has been accomplished in the past 20 years. And we're, it's actually a practical, real thing that we can do and that we can change. We can have an Alberta pension plan, and there's ways to make that happen. We can have an Alberta police force. We can have an Alberta firearms officer. They're realistic, strategic, they're smart goals that are actually realistic. Whereas I find the Alberta Sovereign React to be a pie in the sky. If we don't agree with Ottawa, we're just going to shut them off. Well, what stops Edmonton from saying, we don't agree with the provinces, so we're going to not agree with you there or me. You know, hey, I don't agree with this bill, so I'm going to, I'm going to you know, disregard it. I feel like the Sovereignty Act is a letter to Ottawa with empty, over-political promises. Now, Nadine, I, I want to ask this question because the Sovereignty Act was a big subject tonight a lot of candidates mentioned it even in i think there was in the unity subject they talked about the sovereignty act in the federal health care they talked about the sovereignty act it was a very big subject and a lot of the candidates did attack danielle smith on this and I, I i can't tell you what the act actually reads because i've not sat down and actually read the entire thing so uh i know rebecca schultz said there's some parts of the, the sovereignty act that i agree with but not all of it because like spencer says it, it's just basically a letter to ottawa by giving danielle that stage to talk about it over and over again did the candidates do uh, a favor to danielle by saying hey we don't agree with it, but you're going to talk about it anyway, and I'm just going to keep on talking about it, and people are just going to hear it over and over again, and then start doing their own research. 
think the big difference between uh, Daniel Smith and the others is, is action. So you can write an angry letter or you can put something into legislation that says we are not going to adhere to anything that violates the provincial jurisdiction. And, and she was very clear, you know, sections 94, 94A, 96, all of them, you know, it's in the Constitution. And if you read the UCP documents, actually, much of what she's talking about already is in those documents, in the resolutions, written by the grassroots members. You know, so it, it, she's not bringing up anything new. It is the fair deal panel that she wants to push through. But it is that next step that says in legislature, in law, you know what? The province is not going to enforce an unlawful act, even if it comes from Ottawa. So and, and she brought up the example of the Emergencies Act in Quebec. You know, legislature got together and said, yeah, no, we reject this. We're not doing it. And guess what? It works. So, you know, that we just need action, right? That's what Albertas are looking for. They're looking for a, a defense, a wall, something that says, you know, no, we've got, you know, something here to push back with. And I think if you can come together as the province and as legislation, and it, it, it's an act that you, it, this is not an angry letter. This is legislation that says, we are not going to enforce anything in which Ottawa, treads on our provincial jurisdiction, jurisdiction that we already have. Yeah. Thank you for that. So I'm just, again, keeping the pace going here. We're going to be talking about our next candidate here. And we're going to start with Nadine on this one. And that is Rajan Sani, uh, the MLA for Calgary Northeast, the former Minister of Transportation. Any highlights there for you, Nadine, on Ms. Sani's uh, performance tonight? Or da any negatives? Um, I think the negative for her were the number of attacks that she uh, sent back to Daniel Smith. Um, I think, you know, she did it again and again and again and again, which really just bought more and more attention and gave Danielle more airtime, which I was thankful for. <laughs> but it, it really did not, I think, show well on her part. But I thought that, you know, she speaks with conviction. And I thought that tonight she did show a lot of heart and a lot of fight. And I, I appreciate that. So if there was one thing that she brought to the table tonight was the energy of, you know, uh, I'm not backing down and I'm in this to win. And, uh, you know, kudos to her for that because, um, you know, it became, it was loud and clear. Uh, Spencer, what about yourself? How did you think Ray Jones did? Uh, I think that she, I think she did really well. I think she, to me, she exceeded expectations. She kind of played the role of attack dog during the debate, which, if you've watched enough debates, there's a couple of people that play that role, and I think she played that role really well. Um, she also, throughout the debate, her team was posting memes. I don't know if you saw that, but they were posting memes against Danielle Smith as well. Um, and I thought that was interesting that her... It was interesting because some candidates were attacking Trudeau, others were attacking Notley, and she was attacking Smith. Uh, and I think that using anger and fear to incite your base is effective. I don't know whether that's the right or wrong thing to do, um, but she was certainly played the role of attack dog and, and did it well tonight. Now, I'm not sure if it was the luck of the draw or if she was ready for it, but um, she looked like, and correct me if I'm wrong, and anyone can take this question, she looked like she put Danielle Smith on her back heels for a few rounds when she was talking about the cancer uh, statement that she uh, released earlier this week during her podcast. Um, am I right to assume that that was probably one of the toughest blows throughout the night where it looked like Danielle Smith was actually trying to regain footing in the, that, in that back and forth between Rajon and Danielle? Anyone? I think that if you read Danielle's body language and her tone of voice and even like the flushness of her skin, I think at some point she looked a little flush, like she looked like she was being overwhelmed and attacked, which she was. And she mostly kept her composure, but I think that reading her body language, she was certainly taken aback sometimes and, you know, could have perhaps stayed a little more composed. And um, I think that she certainly put her on her toes for sure. Nadine, you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I think that uh, the whole cancer uh, comment itself is what's putting her back. I don't think that was Raji actually had 
much influence. She just happened to be the one who voiced it loudest and then kept on it. You know, Brian Jean tried to bring it up again. Everybody tried to bring it up. Taze tried to bring it up. Um, you know, but the thing is, is if we, we, we can't expect per, for perfection either from our MLAs and premiers. And, and Danielle has been a radio show host, which I, I agree, she needs to be a little less that right now because that will get her into trouble stick to your you know not your talking points you don't want to be that politician either but stick to your strengths stick to the the important issues don't get caught up in a 300 dollar health spending account yeah you know like to me that's that's the one fault i've seen so far and i think she's just overreaching just trying to be so many things to different people and again i think that that might be more of an issue with notley not so much here with the leadership so I mean, my advice is you know stick to your knitting stick to the big issues um know them well and just it, it the media and because she is the front runner and because she is proposing something different um you know the kenny administration kenny ran his entire administration from a place of fear it was top down nobody else had a voice or a say you know the inner circle and so you know i, I think that really reflects on all of the the people who were in that kenny administration you see a little bit of that still um, with each of them and how they respond and some of the words that they choose. So I, I would caution all of them also on their, their attacks because it, it doesn't, um, it, it just reflects so much of the Kenny, you know, legacy that people have very clearly said we don't want. Thank you. And now the last, next candidate is Rebecca Schultz, the MLA for Calgary Shaw, former Minister of Children's Services. I think this is... Spencer's turn on how she did, or was it Nadine's? I think no, I think it is the Spencer's turn. I apologize. Yes, it is Spencer's turn. Spencer, how did Rebecca Schultz, the uh, MLA for Calgary Shaw, do tonight? Highs and lows. I think she did well. She she spoke well. Um, she talked a lot about the child care issue, which I think is a is an issue that's important for Albertans. But I wish that she had a broader topics to talk about as well, because that's one issue and it's an important issue but i think there was other things that she could have talked about to add value or some of her ideas for the future she said something like i'm the only one who's ever negotiated successfully with ottawa which you know all of the ministries every day have to successfully negotiate with ottawa when it comes to building infrastructure or the orphan wells project all sorts of things so i think that she misspoke a little bit there but um i mean as a rookie mla and really they're all rookie mlas except for you know danielle and brian i guess um, I think she did. I think she did well. Nadine, what about yourself? Um, you know, I again, I, I there's, it's the middle child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they always kind of get ignored or neglected. Um, not that they're bad or they're good or they're great. They're just, you know, you're kind of stuck somewhere in between. And I and I think for her, that's really the that's where she kind of fell for me tonight. Um, you know, I'm very sensitive to some of the, the choices of words. Like one of the choices of words for her was she, when she talked about bringing Albertans along, right? To, to formulate a vision and then bring Albertans along. I just, again, I cringe. I just, I hear Kenny all over it. And I'm like, yeah, this is what we're getting rid of. Right. We don't want this. We want, you know, the grassroots to be heard. We want our MLAs to represent us and not to say that we always get it right either. But, you know, I don't want to be bought along. You know, they did that for two years, you know, and, and I think we're done. So, you know, the middle child. So I'm pretty sure we don't have anything else to say about Rebecca Schultz as much as we probably want to, because I want to make sure we can you continue on. And I'm not sure how long this next segment's going to be. And that is MLA for Chestermere Strathmore, Miss Leela Ahir. Um, I'm going to be up front. I don't really remember her talking that much, but that could be just me. Uh, Nadine, uh, highs and lows for Leela. Um, it, we're going to talk about who is the big loser of the night. I think she was the big loser for the night. Um, 
really didn't say anything that was spectacular, didn't really come out with anything that's memorable, to be honest. And I, I mean, I have 10 pages of notes here in front of me um, as each question was asked. You brought a gun to a knife I fight like... here, Nadine. You brought a gun to a knife fight. Look at that. I love when people come prepared. But anyway, continue. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you want to start talking about like each individual question and how each individual candidate performed on each one, I'm happy to do it. I'm, I'm ready for it. But yeah, no, she was the big, the big loser tonight. Um, again, nothing really memorable, uh, except for the fact that she really just stood out as not being memorable. Uh, what about yourself, Spencer? Spencer? Yeah, oh, he's thinking. Unfortunately, he's, he's thinking. I thought you were frozen. I, I was like, like "Are we?" Are, are, oh, yeah, there's a delay. There is a delay in this. I think right now. So I'm going <laughs> to shut up and let you speak, Spencer. No problem. Sorry, I, you guys. I, were... the, I, I think that was very fitting. <laughs> you guys are laughing, and I didn't Sorry. even see the delay, so that makes it more funny. Um, so, unfortunately, I probably have to agree with you. I, I really like Leela. Um, but like I live tweeted, I don't know, maybe 15 tweets or something on the event. And I was trying to be fair and put out memorable things from each person. And it was hard finding what was memorable with, with Leela, unfortunately. Um, I think that she, um, you know, she did talk about standing up for Alberta oil and gas and exporting and things like that. But I feel like her talking points could have been a little more simple and a little more succinct and a little bit more to the point of more directed and, and more looking forward. Um, yeah, I felt like she could have had a stronger night. She also didn't have the mic very much. Um, but so maybe if she had the mic more, you know, I would have been interested to hear what she had to say more too. The one, the one takeaway that I took from her, Miss Ahir, is when she said, I'm Alberta's number one fan or I'm Alberta's number one supporter, something along that lines. And that was the only thing that I can actually remember from the night. And also when she was talking about immigration and she was saying, we need an Alberta plan. And yet again, I'm not trying to make excuses for anyone, but she did talk about uh, immigration and Danielle did bring that up at the end that I'm glad uh, Leela did uh, talk about immigration. It'd be great to sit down and talk about immigration. Um, but it doesn't sound like we're, I think we're, it sounds like we're all in agreement about uh, Miss Ahir. So we're going to move on to the next one. And that is, of course, we're going to end start on you. Yeah. Actually, I'm not going to start with you, uh, Spencer, on this one, because I'm going to start with Nadine because we started with you on Smith. So I'm going to start with Nadine on Taves. Um, Nadine, Travis Taves, highs and lows for him tonight. Um, the hard part for Taves is he really comes across as Jason Kenney 2.0. And, you know, he was the Minister of Finance. And um, Todd Lowen, again, to his credit, asked him a very direct question about the Auditor General, General report about $4 billion and where was it spent. And he says, oh, every dollar was accounted for. Um, but yet the Auditor General report made it very clear that where was it spent? Yeah, every dollar was accounted for, but we just don't know where what, where it is. And he didn't answer that question. And I think that's probably the biggest question on most people's minds. You know, I think I sent out a tweet, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago or so about Taves. And I said, you know, if he can lose $4 billion as Minister of Finance, how much can he lose as Premier? You know, you have to answer those questions. You can't dodge them. It's just another can he deflect. And so, I mean, I thought that was a big thing for me tonight. The hypocrisy as well, you know, to call out Todd Lowen um, for standing for principles and, you know, be willing to get kicked out of caucus to stand for what his constituents want and then to talk about unity and, you know, and, and trust. The reason, again, we're having this campaign is because people have lost confidence in this Kinney administration, of which he was a very big part of. Spencer, how'd your man do tonight? Um, I think that he he could have done a little better. I think that um, the attack dog or Rajan in this um, case got a lot of, um, in my mind, stuck out more. Um, the four billion dollars. So there's a uh, Kyle Olson with with a uh, he's a with a PR firm. Um, I'm just looking up an article that he wrote, but he said using the grant payment database, he found three point six two billion of the missing. Four billion without much trouble. So it's not so much that the money was missing; it's that 
it didn't always follow best accounting practices or that maybe the reporting on it wasn't as good as it could have been. But I think that during COVID, then sometimes you just had to put money out the door and you had to support people and make sure that people were given the supports that they needed. And, you know, you can, you can find out where the money went after, or you can follow best accounting practices after, but 4 billion certainly didn't go missing by any means. I think that was an exaggerated lie by the NDP. And I'm disappointed that Todd didn't read some of these articles that showed, you know, that 1 billion went to this and 1 billion went to this and 500 mil, 500,000 went to that. Um, but interestingly I, I, enough, Dave had the opportunity to clarify that himself this evening, and he chose not to. And I think that was more my my point was it's not that it went missing. It was okay. So you you say that it's there um, in two sentences. You should be able to say it went here, 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 and here. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah. We we talked about body language with Danielle Smith. I'm going to talk about a little bit of body language with uh, Travis Taves here for a second. And I want to get your opinion. Why does he move his arms so much when he's talking? Like his arms were up and down the entire night. Like that's when he was on screen. That's what I was looking at. And again, I'm not I'm not a body language expert. Maybe that maybe he's a very uh, handy person when he talks, and that's a really weird statement to say about a politician. But maybe he talks with his hands, and he's he's dramatic in that way. But to me, it just seemed like he was very nervous and he was always trying to figure out how do I emphasize what I'm talking about with my hands? Did anyone else come, did that come across for anyone else or am I just the only one on that? Nadine? I would say that- Oh, Spencer, Spencer, go first. <laughs> no problem. I would say, and I, and I know Travis really, really well. I have a lot of respect for Travis, but I would say that he doesn't always have as much charisma um, I'd say even as, as Danielle Smith or as Jason Kenney or as some others do, sometimes, um, I don't know if awkward is the right word or not, um, he's an accountant and I've heard him give really long boring presentations on stage talking about numbers and pie charts and so forth and he knows his stuff really well. Um, but I think that... He was trying to come across charismatic and it just didn't fly for me. Like A little it? awkward. Yeah. A little awkward. Because it's not a natural strength that he has. He's not as smooth of a talker or as charismatic, maybe as some of the other leaders would be. Nadine, last uh, last uh, qu uh, statement on that for you, and then we'll move on to our last leader before we get on to the next topic. Yeah, I really uh, look at body language a lot. And to me, his body language tonight, he lacked confidence and conviction in what he was saying. Um, and thus, it, one thing to have your hands down low, when you get your hands flailing around up here, you're, you don't have the confidence or the conviction that you should be. Um, an example of that, when I was, uh, you know, in, in the last election, Derek Sloan here in my riding, for example, you know, I, w one of his tell-alls for me was when he was sitting, he'd start twitching this shoulder. And, and you know, it, every time he wasn't sure about what he was talking about or wasn't truthful in his case, he, his shoulder would twitch and he'd get fidgety in his seat and it was a real tell-all so i think for Taves, it was just a, a lack of confidence now um i want to talk about brian jean but the moment brian jean started to answer his question the feed cut out so <laughs> oh i am I, I i can't i can't have an accurate description and maybe the feed didn't cut out on uh facebook but um what did you think of Brian Jean's performance tonight that was able to be seen during the live portion of the night? Uh, we'll start with Spencer on this one. Um, I thought that Brian, well, and Brian's campaign and his debate today has been weaker than what I would have expected. I expected him to be a front runner with Danielle, him and Danielle neck and neck. And I feel like um, his campaign has been, I don't know, if muted is the right word, not as exciting. Like it hasn't, it hasn't um, gotten a lot of attention, hasn't grown nearly with the momentum that I thought, and I thought that was reflected in the debate as well. He didn't have a lot of new ideas, didn't have a lot of confidence. Um, I was just surprised, um, you know, because I think that the opportunity, it's not his to lose, but I, I certainly would have expected him to come across stronger. Nadine, what about yourself? 
I would totally agree with Spencer. He is very lackluster. And all this talk about the Constitution and changing the Constitution, again, I, I call it hypocrisy. He talks about the Sovereignty Act, which is something that is well within the province's ability to do, but yet he talks about constitutional change. You know, he made a comment tonight about uh, to Toes saying it, he would, Taves, sorry, um, that he would make a great finance minister in a Brian Jean led UCP. And I chuckled to myself and I went, well, you know, Brian Jean would make a great something thing in a Daniel Smith uh, led UCP um, because the only the only place I thought that he really shone um, and he didn't even shine I just like the answer was in you know provincial surplus and uh, balancing the budget you know let's pay down the debt interest rates are not getting any lower you know we've got an opportunity here you know the UCP currently got truly you know as much as Taves would like to take at you know, full credit for balancing the budget, the credit really belongs to the oil and gas industry that rebounded. You know, this government has spent more money than the NDP. Now, granted, there was COVID, I get it, but there's a big button here. You know, we have to balance the budget and we cannot keep moving forward with the debt, uh, you know, hanging over. I have a 10 year old daughter. I'm going, we are, are you know, punishing the next generation so you know i thought if there was one area where he did actually do a good job but i agree totally spencer i was expecting really so much more for him, him and um he really has fallen flat very lackluster i don't really he's not coming up with anything new or anything creative you know wonderful i've been in administration and i've been an M mp and i've been to ottawa and you know it, it's not about you bud it's about Albertans and what you bring to the table. And uh, I, I don't think he's not the guy. I want to, I want to talk one, about one thing that go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. Because I was my, my mind's a little bit. I was going to say one thing topic. that stuck out to me with Brian. Uh, that Brian talked about, he seemed upset that we gave nurses and teachers a 1% pay raise. Um, he talked about the collective bargaining and, and he said, oh, we've been too generous or something like that. And I feel like the average Albertan would get angry at that comment because they've had pay freezes for 10 years. Um, and, you know, the UCP has spent more money on, on education and health care, but I don't think that Albertans want cuts in those sectors. And I think that the 1% per year increases that they received are, are reasonable, if, if even on the low side. And I think that that could certainly be used against him uh, in a general election, if he keeps to those talking points, I think that we're overly generous by 1% pay increases. I want to talk about, he, he, Brian Jean tried to mention his son a few times tonight, and I hate bringing up subjects of uh, death because anyone who knows, uh, I am struggling with cancer myself. I'm currently waiting for treatments, but that's here nor there, and that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here tonight. But Brian Jean wanted to call out Danielle Smith and you could tell in Brian Jean's face that he was angry with Danielle Smith. I think at one point he even said, I'm, uh, I, I, I think it was, I'm disappointed in you, Danielle, for your comments. And then Danielle at the end tried to apologize and tried to uh, offer an olive branch to, uh, uh, Dan, uh, for, to Brian to say, I'm sorry for your son, loss of your son. This, that moment made me think this is going to get nasty over the next few weeks. If Danielle doesn't clarify her apology or come out with a full apology and say, this is what I meant, or I'm sorry if everyone took it this way, something, Brian Jean has ammunition to take to Danielle Smith. Am I not, am I incorrect in thinking this? Nadine? Um, I'm really already tired of the conversation around the cancer comment, just because she did apologize tonight three times, in fact, three times. And, you know, how many, as a politician, it, you know, unless you're Justin Trudeau, it seems, apologies don't work. Um, but she did. She apologized three times. So how much and in what way is it going to be good enough? You know, she made a mistake. She's admitted she's made the mistake. And, you know, it was misconstrued or whatever. She, she ex went into a lengthy explanation. Um, you know, at some point, that's where they've got to accept it for what it is. You know, it was a mistake. It was not quite, she wasn't clear in her thoughts. And, and she got called out on that. And I would agree. She made a comment, 
in a podcast that she probably shouldn't have been doing, <laughs> running for a leadership as a candidate for the UCP, um, you know, on a topic that's not really an issue with UCP members. So, you know, she deserved to be called out on it, but we need to, okay, she's apologized three times in one night and that she's apologized prior to this. So move on. No, and I appreciate that, and I'm gonna. I'm just gonna interject here for two seconds, Spencer, before I throw it over to you. If this story still goes on next week, week after, then I, I agree with you. This is still fresh for a lot of people right now, and I'm not saying anything. I think you're right. Politicians do make mistakes. I'll admit I make mistakes. I ran for politics once, and we all know the spectacle that that was. So I will never do that again. But I understand people make mistakes. It's just if it does go continue on till next week, week after, then okay, so we need to have a serious conversation about this. But if she's apologized, which you say she did, I, I, I listened and it might have cut out or was cutting out in the first few parts of Rajan and her going back and forth. But here we are. We're still a week into this, and it's it was Sunday, and it's only Wednesday now, right? So we're still kind of fresh into this, but that's why I wanted to bring it up. Uh, uh, Spencer, last comment to you on this before we wrap up and we start talking about the questions and then the big winners of the night. Um, I'm also surprised. I had assumed that Brian and Danielle, um, so I like, they liked each were, other. I thought they liked each other. <laughs> And like Nadine, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I've never met you before, but I would assume that if you had voted for Danielle number one, Brian would be number two and vice versa. That's what I had assumed as I had grouped, um, like I like I grouped the UCP cabinet together, you're either voting for Raja number one, Rebecca number two, Taves, or, or somewhere in that order, and that the, the, that the Smith and um, uh, Brian Jean Camps would be the same, but it's interesting to watch them diverge from each other. Before you answer that question, Nadine, because I know you want to answer that question, we're going to get to that question later on in a few minutes, but I want to talk about this. This, And I'm going to ask this question open-ended to uh, Nadine first. I, I know who you're going to say is the winner of the night because we've relatively dissected that. Who was the number two tonight? Who was the one that you went, holy crap, you actually did a lot better than I expected, or holy crap, Maybe I can consider you as a alternative to my number one without giving away who your alternative to number one is, because I'm going to ask that later. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, Sonny was was the number two. Um, and I would say as far as, you know, expectations went tonight, she far exceeded my expectation just because she she came with fight. She did. She dug her heels in and she had grit and I didn't like all the personal attacks, like the consistent, you know, coming back to the same talking point. But, you know, I thought she bought it. And so she would definitely be the, the, the shining star if there was one this evening. Danielle is is more, you know, you, you, you expect more from her. Right. So my bar is set a little bit higher. I thought she did good. I mean, I've seen her answer some things much better, um, but each night is always a little bit different. But she she bought her game and, and she held her own. And in my opinion, she is the only one who is going to hold her own against a Rachel Notley in 2023. Um, but, you know, Shawnee, I thought she did a she was a, a, a stellar performance tonight. What about yourself, uh, uh, Spencer? I, I know you're probably a uh, Taves man, but who was your number two tonight? Was there any shocker for you tonight that went home? I might consider changing my second place vote to another person because of tonight's performance debate. I don't even know if Taves won. I mean, you're assuming that I would say that Taves won. And well, you, gonna, you may... Okay, no. okay. So um, let's, let's ask, think, ask yeah. that question right here. Um, Nadine, I'm assuming you think Smith won, correct? Um, I would argue that that Danielle probably won the debate as a whole. I mean, there's areas that she really, I thought, could have done much better. There was times when, um, you know, I thought the answers were a little bit weak. But even when she came out attacked, she, she regroups very quickly and she comes back very responsive. So she's that very uh, steady, even keel um, kind of can rebound from just about anything. So I, I think she definitely won uh, tonight's debate. So uh, then Spencer, then who do you think won tonight's debate? 
So I, I think Rajan won in the fact that she exceeded expectations and came across more um, eloquent and more attacky and took a lot of airtime. I think in a if you're a Rajan fan in a positive way, um, you know, I'm certainly a Taves fan and he still has my vote. He certainly didn't lose the debate. He didn't say anything stupid or have any bozo eruptions. I feel like he was composed and elegant and vanilla, which I think you maybe need to be. But in terms of who won, I, I think Rajan um, exceeded expectations. And so I, I don't know if that wins or not, but I, I think she did really well. What about your second place? Was there someone who you were, because you say she might have won because she exceeded expectation. Was there anyone that you were going into this thinking, okay, maybe I'd put myself into that camp if my first place person got knocked off? Or are you putting Rajan in that camp as well? Well, I, I'd have Taves number two. Um, I'll, I have bias for sure, but I felt like he was composed. Um, in my opinion, Premier-like. Um, sometimes you have to be vanilla, and sometimes being sexy or being, um, you know, pie-in-the-sky ideas isn't always the, the best, but I thought he was consistent and steady and had practical solutions and practical ideas. So now I'm going to ask the million. Oh, go ahead. Okay, okay. We got the the gentle lady from Banff Airdrie has the floor for 45 seconds. Whenever you're ready, no clapping. Don't make me turn around, audience. I will ask you, and I will stand up if you do it again. Go ahead, Miss Nadine Wellwood. The last thing this province needs right now is vanilla, and I'm going to say that not because it's Taves, but because we are literally at war with an ideology. You know, we have an ideology of, you know, wokeism that's right here on our doorstep and we need to tackle it. And you're not going to do that with vanilla. We have a federal government that is abusive um, to this province. And I don't think we're going to win that war either being vanilla or being nice. We do need a little bit more attack dog. And so, you know, to me, you know, Daniel Smith is the right person to do that. And, and, and again, Shawnee tonight showed a side that I didn't think she had. And I was impressed by that. Uh, Taves being vanilla, wrong time, wrong place. I think there's a leader for every time and he's just not it. So my last question to both of you is this. The three of us are very political observers. We actually sat down and watched two hours of interrupted, yes, interrupted debate. Um, does the average voter in Alberta, the average person in Alberta, sit down and watch two hours of this and come away with something different than they go in? Or are they just looking at the Twitter? And I, I, I say this with respect to the organizers of the debate because I know I've organized debates municipally and they are a gong show of epic proportions and I, they, they take time away from campaigning. But is this the best use of the time for the candidates? Because the average voter, I would say, does not sit down on a Wednesday night and watch a debate live. They're gonna watch it four days from now. Did this make any difference at the end of the day? Spencer. So I'm going to disagree with you slightly, Chris. The average voter isn't on Twitter. The average voter isn't gonna watch the debates. What the average voter is going to do is they're going to listen to the news, they're going to watch CTV or CBC or, or the radio, and whatever sound bites the media takes from these debates is what they're going to interpret the debates as who won or who lost or, or what things were said. So I think that the average quote unquote non political observer that just does their day and goes to barbecues and occasionally pays attention to these things, like I may occasionally pay attention to the CFL, is just going to hear highlights or lowlights based on what mainstream media tells them and nadine does this does this sway the voters in any way like uh, like spencer said not a lot of people are going to watch two hours of uh people talking and about things that really they don't have any interest in because they're trying to put food on their table and they're trying to make sure there's gas in the car so they can take their kids to the hockey game um, does this sway people in any matter? Like, are there going to be swing voters that come out tomorrow morning and say, you know what, because of that Todd Lowen debate performance last night, 
I'm putting him as number one. Or are people just going to wait to see where the chips fall with the media, with the social media, with their friends, with the newspapers that they read, with their uh, web shows that they watch because they're watching ours always. So are people going to be swayed? I think the important thing here to note is the election itself. This is a membership election. And because of the issues you just pointed out, affordability, cost of living, inflation, gas prices, people are paying more attention to this than you might realize right now because it's hurting them directly. And because this is a membership, um, you know, we're already members. So we already are the one, two percent of voters right, that are politically engaged, politically involved, politically active. So for that reason, yes, I think there are more people. And I think because this is, we are at such a critical point in, um, you know, so many issues, both federally, provincially, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people right now trying to find the next who who is going to be that person to lead the ucp and that they're, they're also weighing that in a little bit with well who's going to be the person to take on rachel notley in 2023 which is we saw that come up amongst many of the candidates but right now it, it's really focused around the leadership of the ucp and so for that reason i think yeah things like tonight make a big difference because you are going to have people that go yes yeah, so-and-so was really good like me I, you know shawnee i thought was like wow She's got a little pit bull in there. Good for her, you know. Um, there's some fight, which I, I would never have seen, but I'm watching, and I'm not the only one. Um, you know, now, if this was a federal election, as we know, some of the lowest voter turnouts, people just vote, uh, I, my family's always this way, I vote that way, they pay no attention. You know, provincially, we get a little bit more turnout, a little bit more engagement, but I think right now, because people are hurting so badly, yeah, they are watching. They're they're listening to see who's going to give them more affordability. The member from Spruce Grove, yes, I finally remembered where he's from, uh, Spencer. Uh, well, you have forty five seconds to rebut. Thank you, sir. So, um, I think that what this debate does is those that are politically involved and that do watch and do pay attention um, have to decide who their number two, three, and four are going to be. And I think that this debate could change minds in regards to, you know, who I vote for, for, you know, in a ranked ballot situation. So I think that this debate can have an impact on on average voters because I think that people have a more open mind than uh, I'm going to vote for my conservative guy against Trudeau and it's that cut and dry, whereas here... I think there's a, a wide slate of well-qualified candidates, and it's a matter of who we rank and in which order we rank them in. And I want to remind everyone, and this is the big thing that I always try to plug here, this field is not set. So remember, there are still people who need to fill out the, the raise their hundred and seventy five thousand dollars to put their money in. Some candidates have already put in their hundred and seventy five. Some have not. So we could still see a field shrink before August 12th when that membership deadline is and also before the ballots are printed. So if you are interested in helping a candidate, go get involved. Nadine, uh, Spencer, I've said it eloquently. This is a vote of who you want to lead the province, not for just tomorrow, but for 10 years from now. And it is a deciding factor. Um, if you don't vote, do not complain. Or if you do vote, if you don't vote, and you better vote in the provincial election. If not, I don't want to hear you complaining on social media for the next year. Because I just don't like people complaining who say they don't vote. Even if you go and spoil your ballot. I don't care. Just go vote. Um, Nadine, Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. I know we tried to cover as lot as possible, but an hour has flown by. And we will probably have you back for the next one for sure. And Nadine, will have you on for a special episode as well. Just you and me. And we'll talk about politics in general like Spencer and I did. Um, Spencer and Nadine, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, and Spencer, it was a pleasure. I would happily do this with you again anytime. Thank you, Nadine.
So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the Cross Board Interviews live UCP Leadership Debate Recap. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with our entertainment rundown. And then Friday, we have a uh, interview with UC, uh, not UCP, with uh, Dave Cornier, Dave, Dave Berta. So please tune in to, for those. And then we are off the week of August 1st because it's the long weekend and we have some things that we have to do medically. And we'll be back the following week. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media. Go have a conversation with somebody because it does make our society better. It makes our democracy better. And sometimes just having conversations makes ourselves better. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking.